Well, today is June 18th, 2017. The title of today's message is Gibber Hayil, A Father's Day Charge. Amen. Gibber Hayil, A Father's Day Charge. We'll, we'll go over that, and then you'll uh, be very familiar with these words here in just, in just a little while. Um, our church is a special place. I've been in other churches, and uh, when we get to Mother's Day, everything on Mother's Day is just really sweet. You know, you get flowers for the moms, or you get some type of gift, and everybody's really, you show videos that start, you know, pulling the tears right out of your eyes. Even the guys are kind of like, no, it was the sun in my eyes, you know. And, and what we do is when we get to Father's Day, a lot of churches are kind of like, we, we get silly. <laughs> we start putting up bad Father's Day jokes. I was actually going to try to find a video for you guys, and they were all ridiculous. All the ones that, I, that would be appropriate enough to show you were dads being silly and just a lot of silliness. That's not the kind of church that we are. That's not what we're going to do is we're not going to make fun of fathers. We're not going to talk about uh, bad dad fashion. We're not going to talk about dad bods, and we're not going to talk about bad dad jokes. This is not what we're going to talk about. Over the last 10 days or so, uh, we've had some pretty incredible teaching, and I, I want to just kind of summarize this for you. And while I'm doing this, why don't you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel, chapter 23. We're going to start off reading a few verses together. Amen. Second Samuel, chapter 23, and verse 20. It says this, Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, was a valiant fighter. Everybody say valiant. Yeah, that's, he's, a, he's a bad boy, man. He is a valiant fighter from the house of a priest. His, backing, his background was being in a priest household, and he became a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. By the way, I was looking at this this morning, and when it says that it was their best men, it actually, in the original text, it says that these are two lion-like men. I didn't know that. We studied this at our, at our men's reload. We went over ben and, I, ben and Aya and talked about his valiant exploits. And we talked about going in and attacking not just one guy. He didn't pick the run of the litter. He picked not only one main guy, but he picked two lion-like men and went after them. That, that's something special. That's the kind of men that we're raising up here in this church. Amen. It goes on to say, he also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Yeah, he killed two lion-like men, and then just in case you thought it was just some metaphor, he actually went in a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. It still blows my mind. Like, you're walking by the pit, and you hear the lion roar, roar and you go, yeah, that's where I need to be, right there. <laughs> that's an incredible kind of person here. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. In other accounts, he's somewhere around seven, seven and a half feet tall. A huge, everybody say huge. huge. Yeah, huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Ben and Aya went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. There's something about that story that just makes me smile. What's up there, Goliath? Boom, give me that. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. You're never outmanned, you're never outgunned, you're never outmatched when you have the Lord and you have this kind of spirit. I wrote down a few things from the men's reload that I want to share it with you. If you were there, you know these things. These are my takeaways, just single lines that I wrote. There's entire messages usually around them, and I'm just going to read this to you. That LCM men are going to be the most loving husbands, the most tender fathers, and the most vicious lion killers in the world. As pastors, we don't brand sheep. We lead them. As men in LCM, we don't dance with giants. We kill them. The answer to your why is always found in your purpose. These are just snippets, one-liners from throughout the time. Our provision will follow our purpose. It should not lead it. Our job is to make our wives holy and not only happy. I should get an amen. amen. At least from the men. I know y'all just got scared there. But that's why I started off with the lion killer guy, right? Our job, our exclusive job as husbands is not to make our wives happy. That's not the goal. We're supposed to help them to be holy and godly, and that will produce God's joy in your home. Amen. 
That's going to be the, the fruit, not the goal. Amen? Y'all got all quiet on me there. We must choose the perfect stones to defeat the enemy, not describe the enemy. Sometimes we, we look at the giants in our life and we want to get a scripture and we're afraid, so we pick a scripture that talks about fear. How about you get a scripture that talks about defeating fear? That's what we need to be doing, picking perfect stones. We won't stop fighting until all the fighting is done. For righteousness' sake, we must work in teams. You guys remember that section? That was an incredible revelation from Pastor Matt. We never, ever move on from what we've learned. In other words, we never outgrow the basics of what God has given us. We're supposed to go after it in everything we do. There's an ever-narrowing way before us, and we're supposed to press forward into that. We should be defined by our action, not our inaction. We want to be emptied. We want to be wrecked men. We want to have a mezuzah, and our mezuzah must always involve our fellow man. We want to be DCD kind of Christians. Amen? A lot of other things that I had on here. That was just last week. This week, I have a few things for you. We talked about on Monday night, we talked about Yare and Kathoth. Fear and discouragement. Don't let fear and discouragement overcome you. You guys remember that from Monday night? Yes. Did you hear some of the words that came forth today that was talking about fear and discouragement? How that we're supposed to overcome that? Don't let it keep you from the land. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from the land. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from recovering from your recent defeat. After today's victory, remember it for the next fight. Allowing fear and discouragement allows the tyranny of giants for an extended period of time. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from building the temple. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from leading the people. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from defending God's holy place, Jerusalem. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from facing tomorrow. It could be the very day of your deliverance. Don't let fear keep you from seeing God is in your midst. Don't let fear and discouragement cause you to give preference to men rather than to God. God's shepherds will come and you will no longer have to give way to fear and discouragement ever again. <laughs> when he comes, fear and discouragement will be banished and you will have peace and security. No one will ever cause you to be afraid or discouraged again. Don't let fear and discouragement keep you from speaking God's word to them. God will make you harder than them so you don't have to give in to fear and discouragement. And lastly, for life and peace, you must properly fear the Lord and allow Him to encourage you, and Him only. These were the first 17 times, the first 17 verses that these scriptures are used. This was just this week, folks. I, I think God's been speaking to us a Father's Day message for a while now. Yesterday we learned in a parenting class that as parents it is our responsibility given by God to look after our kids. It is no one else's responsibility. We can't hand it to the church you can't even hand it to me as a pastor and say, Pastor, you got to do this. Amen. We're here to help you, but it's your responsibility. It's your privilege to get to do this because you represent God to your kids. You are the picture of God to your children. What you allow, they will allow, and probably more. What you restrict, they will restrict. What you think about God, they will begin to think about God. Our goal is to raise godly adults who can replicate us. Plus. This is what we've been talking about. In each meeting that we've been in in the last few days, we talked about the Amats on Wednesday, an ever-increasing strength. I think the Lord is giving us the right kind of messages that build together. We're not the kind of the church that, that intentionally sets out to do a series on a given topic. But what we often find out is that we have done a series on a given topic based on what God does, when we look back, we see, oh, Lord, you're threading these things together. Lord, you're speaking to the men today. Lord, you've been speaking to us for a while now to remind us to go back to fundamentals, to have stones that are in your pocket, to have the right kind of scripture cards. Men, if you have them with you and in arm's reach, I want you to pick them up and show them to me. Can y'all just look around for a second? <laughs> this should encourage you, ladies. This should be a blessing to you. 
your husbands are trying to get into the Word and have the right stone to kill the giant. And we're not going to dance with it. We're not going to just describe the giant. Thank you. You can put it down. We want to have the right kind of stones to kill the giants that are in front of us because we'll be better men when we do it. We'll lead you better. Our homes will be better when we have the Word of God ever in our mouth, ever on our heart, within reach at all times. I'm proud of you men. If you haven't done that, you don't have to be at the men's retreat to do that. Pastor Matt or I or one of these men who were there, one of the men that you saw raise their hands, if you need to understand how to do the stones, just get with us. We have a very focused outlook on what scriptures we want to carry with us. And what we do is we flip through them all day long. Multiple times a day, I go through my whole stack. I've got things to remind me how to be a good husband. I've got things to remind me what I'm supposed to do as a pastor. I've got things that will help me to kill the giants in my own life. This is what we've been doing. On Father's Day, I appreciate the Lord being a great father to us. Joy, if you put up the first slide there. In the Old Testament, the term God was used at least 2,600 times. The term God, Yahweh. In the Old Testament, the term Father, as it reference to God being our Father, not just a human Father, was used less than 10 times. Out of 2,619 times that the Old Testament explains God a certain way, it was 10 or less times it was used to explain Him as Father. Look at the last point there. Jesus teaches us to relate to God as Father. Over 250 times in the Newer Testament, the idea of God our Father is used. 42 times in the book of Matthew alone. Isn't that something that's incredible? This idea of fathers, how important are fathers when you look at it in that respect. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. It says this, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. We could just say that about today, can't we? In a worship service like we just had, we can say that. I, let, me, let me stop and mention this about the worship service. Man, what an incredible, powerful worship service from the get-go. I love the fact that Pastor Matt was sensitive enough to the Spirit. He literally ejected his entire song list and made it up right there on the spot. What a blessing that the worship team follows him so well. Just going on. Even in a, in a day like today where you could feel the very presence of our Father with us, as a pastor, I also sensed other things. I sensed folks in here who did not and were not able to connect with that same spirit that I was experiencing. Man, our goal today my heart's cry for you is that you will be able to enjoy the presence of the Lord, that you will not be separated from a loving Father who's actually wanting and drawing you to Him, that you will not stay separate from Him. And yet, even in our, in our little church, even with as much of the power of God that was going on, new songs being sung to the Lord. God, what is precious things. Words of prophecy, words and tongues coming forth today. Man, how special is that? Just because it happens here often, we must not lose how special that is that God is our Father. He's reaching out to us. It matters to me that not everyone in here was able to enjoy that. It matters to me. Because I know that my Father sees those things. And what He's afforded to us is something that is incredible. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. My goodness. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We are the children of God. The reason the world does not know us is because it didn't know Him. The reason that you may sit in here today, the reason that some may look at us from afar and go, yeah, I don't understand what you guys are doing. I, I don't recognize you. I don't understand you. It's because they didn't recognize or understand the Father either. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. <laughs> Isn't that true? Our final state what, I, what I'm going to be when I grow up is not always quite yet known. I know in the natural, I'm a grown up, I'm an adult, I get that. There's a purpose that I'm running towards. And what this thing is going to look like when we have our glorified bodies, when we stand victorious with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand all that yet. 
I'm not sure that it's completely known. But what we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. It doesn't really matter about the specifics to me because when he shows up, when he comes back as the conquering king, you know what? I'm going to be just like him. I'm going to look just like my dad. I'm going to ju look just like him as he returns. For we will see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You know how you understand what God is like? Is you start, when you realize and you think on him, your immediate response is that you want to be pure before him. You want to have clean hands and a pure heart. In Matthew chapter 5, it says that the pure in heart will see God. It's almost like John, the apostle, understood what was happening on the Sermon on the Mount. Those who are pure will get to see him. Next slide, Joy. We're talking about fathers and the importance of having a father. We mentioned this the other day. The word for father in the Hebrew starts off with the very first letter, an alf. The first strength leader, that's what that letter actually represents. In the Hebrew language, it not only has a sound associated with it, each letter has a number that's associated with it. Each letter, at least in its original form, in the paleo, in the more ancient form, it has a picture. It has terms that are associated with it. So when you're learning, it's not just a letter and a sound. I'm so glad that my wife has got these skills to help teach our kids to read since we homeschool, because that would not be... I don't think our kids would be reading without my wife, right? She, she was able to do that. She, what do you do? You teach them phonics. You teach them what a sound looks like, what it sounds like, a long or a short sound. This has got more depth, more layers to it, right? We have the first letter, alf, first, strength, or leader. And then it's combined with the very second letter, abet, which means house or family, like Beth Lehem, the house of bread, or Beth L, the house of God. These are, these are part in common in their, in their language. And when you put them together, you get the word ab, A-B. And this is teaching. When you're putting the first letters together, the first word that a little child will learn is when you put A together with B, you get the word ab. And that means it's the leader of the house. It's the word for father in their language. They learn it as leader of the house. Another letter that we know very well is a hey. Everybody say hey. hey. It's the picture of the hands lifted up. Or it's an open window. It means revelation or breath or, or inspiration from God. We understand that it's this. The next, the next slide. When you put the letter hey in the middle of a father, when you put the very letter that represents the Spirit of God or His revelation, when you drop God's Spirit down into a father, you know what you get the word for? Love. When the strong leader of a house has God's spirit and God's revelation within him, you know what it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be the very definition of what love is. Amen. Uh, guys, this is just an alphabet lesson in Hebrew, right? Amen. Do you see how these things work? And we're, it's revelatory for us. We're like, these are the ABCs, and it, I'm getting revelation. I'm getting encouragement. When I have the spirit of God at work in me, you know what it's supposed to teach my kids? It's almost like I am the actual representation of God himself to my family. I help them define what this is about. We can learn, continue to learn about the Lord. We get the reflection of the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. The Son can do nothing by himself. God, he can only do what he sees the Father doing. How important is it for us to keep our eyes on the Father? Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Look at Colossians 1.15. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Can you see God? Only when you look at Jesus. The firstborn over all creation. Hebrews 1.3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact. Everybody say exact. Yeah. He's the exact representation. <laughs> when you have kids... Isn't it, it's always interesting to me, what I learned from having kids was this. I would see my son do something and realize that I never taught him how to do that. Why does he like to do certain things? We actually had this discussion yesterday in our house. Our youngest was on the couch, and she, wanted, she was like, Dad, why do I like to get squished so far into the couch? And I was like, I, I don't know. I think you got that from your mom. <laughs> 
She's a cuddle bug. Gabe used to do the same thing when he was a little kid. He would get in there, and you know how you pretend like you're going to sit on your kid? He would be like, yes, do it. You're like, okay, haha. And you get up, and he's like, no, come sit on me. He, there was something about it. He just liked, he just liked full contact. He's like, yes, please squish me. I mean, he'd be a little three or four year old. Be like, <laughs> you don't teach a kid that. You know, this is what you should like, son. Yeah, now he's like, thanks, Dad. Yeah, thanks, appreciate that, Dad. I'm gonna go crawl under a rock now, Dad. Thanks. There are some things that we see in our kids that we didn't intentionally put in them. They're just replications of us. Certain likes and dislikes that you're like, I could have never taught them that. They just, how do they do, why do they respond that way? It's because they are, rep, they are replicas of us. Jesus, the Son, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's being. The truth is, is no matter how similar, we used to say this, that Gabe looks like me and acts like Christy. Olivia is beautiful, so she looks like Christy and acts like me. That's overly simplified. Because Olivia has beautiful characteristics like Christy. Gabe has some pretty fantastic characteristics like no. Okay. <laughs> but the son is the exact representation. What he is, is what the father is. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We see these pictures. Why are we talking about this? We're setting up... We're setting up an idea of what fathers are and what we're supposed to be replicating, man. On the next one, we have reflections of Father. We see Jesus, if He is the exact representation of God, we see what He did. He's moved with compassion. A man with leprosy came to Him, begged Him on His knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Have you ever been so desperate that you're willing to beg for something? There used to be phrases in our culture that someone would come to you with hat in hand. They would take off their hats to show that they are uncovered and undone and they would walk up to somebody hat in hand and yeah I need your help yeah I can't make the payment I, I can't do it by myself I need you to come and help me we, we kinda get away from that nowadays we want to be too dignified this guy comes and begs on hands and knees Lord if you're willing you can make me clean filled with compassion everybody say filled, filled. thank you God that you're filled with compassion goodness gracious, that His mercies are made new every morning, that His loving kindness is always before us. Jesus reached out His hand and touched the man. I am willing. Thank you, Jesus. Be clean. Immediately the leprosy left Him. The next one. We can go to Luke. Do you realize that the giving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the story that Jesus Christ used, is about a father? Luke 11. Which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish would give him a snake instead. Hey, Dad, I'm hungry. Awesome, let me go get you a poisonous snake. Wait, what? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. Wait a minute, I'm not evil. Yeah, but we're going to compare this to God. We're going to compare this to His greatness. And if we being weak, human, whatever we are, if we know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Everybody say, how much more? How much more? This is a Calve Comer argument. This is a Calve Comer teaching, a, a Jewish principle that says we're going to set up a light and a heavy. We're going to set up a simple example to teach you about something that isn't as simple. We're going to show you a contrast. If you, then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? If you're here today and you do not have, you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. If you're here today and you haven't been baptized enough in the Holy Spirit, how much more will the Father give it to you if you ask? You can come up here and you want and we'll pray for you. The truth is, you've got to ask for it. One of the most intriguing things as a pastor and we love you guys and we know that it's from a good heart here pastor pray for this person they're getting drug up to the front uh they they need to get baptized in the holy spirit here do your thing <laughs> hey do you actually want to be filled with the holy spirit 
Oh, then this is going to be a long prayer. <laughs> if somebody wants to be filled with the Spirit and ask the Lord, you know what happens? He fills you. I'm not going to walk down a big, long formula for you. You get your heart right before Him and you ask Him and He fills you. Period. That's the way that this works. Why? Because He's a good Father. And this is the scenario that, that the Word teaches us. In Luke 15, we know the story of the prodigal son. I'm not even going to read it to you right now. And by the way, we call this the story of the prodigal son. I think it's better named the story of the incredibly loving father. The focus is actually, we talk about the story of the prodigal son going away, squandering all his wealth. Actually squandering all of his father's wealth. Hey dad, I want to go. I want what's due to me. I want my inheritance now. Which means what? It means I don't care that you're still my father and you're still here. I want your stuff, but I don't actually want to have anything to do with you, Dad. Just give me what's mine, what's coming to me. And the father does it. Gives it to him. He squanders it all. What happens on the next slide? He's coming back from a long way off. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. <laughs> Anybody ever been a long way off from the Lord? Anybody ever been on the wrong side of what you were supposed to be doing? Anybody ever been distant from the Lord? While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. Thank you, Jesus. Again, filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. This story is about the loving father who while we are a long way off, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why? Because he wanted to demonstrate his love to us. An incredible, incredible thing. These are things that we know. We've, we've talked about these things. We understand the love of the Father. At least we've talked about it enough where we should. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. And we're going to start in verse 14. Going to get into the meat of what we have here. Deuteronomy 10, 14. It says this. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. At this church, and you guys know this, I love the fact that we see the compassion of God throughout the Older Testament and the Newer Testament. We see a God filled with compassion, longing to be with him. He set his affection on your forefathers and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above, above all the nations as it is today. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. Everybody say mighty, mighty. And, awesome. and awesome, who shows no partiality and he accepts no bribes. What an interesting thing. You can't bring enough gifts to the altar to bribe him. You can't give enough to church to undo what we've done. He wants, he is a God that is mighty and awesome. The next slide shows us what the word for mighty is here. The word for mighty is the word gibor. The word gibor. You'll hear Pastor Eric actually refer to, to his son Gabe that way. Gibber. What he's, what he's reminding him of, here's what it says. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little small. It's a word for powerful, warrior, sometimes even a tyrant, a champion, a chief, one who excels, a giant, a mighty man, a strong man, a valiant man. This idea that God is an awesome God, that he is mighty and strong. This is the word that's actually used to describe the Lord here. What an interesting thing. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. You can keep it on the slide here, Joy. We'll just have everyone turn there. Joshua chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 14. Actually, let's go to verse 12. Let's go to verse 12. But to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the command that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you. Everybody say, remember. remember. Yeah, if the Lord has been speaking to you, Men, if the Lord has been doing things in your life, if the Lord has been encouraging you, if the Lord has been challenging you, 
you should remember it. You should write it down in a way that you will remember, that you are moved by it, that you change what you have not been doing to be exactly what he's telling you to do. We have to be men of action, not of inaction. The Lord your God is giving you rest and has granted you this land. Verse 14, your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men, everybody say fighting men, men. fully armed must cross over ahead of your brothers. You are to help your brothers. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, I need my brothers. Turn to the other neighbor on the other side that you didn't want to talk to and say, my brothers need me. We need our brothers. The, The word of God actually instructs us this here. But these fighting men, it's not only a Gibor kind of man, not only a mighty man, but this fighting man here adds another word to it. The next word is this. It's Hayu. Actually, it's Chayu. Everybody do that. Chayu. Gibber Chayu is what's being said right here. Give me men who are not only mighty, but this word Chayu, it's a force. Whether of men it means or other resources. It's an army. It's a wealth. It's virtue. It's valor. It's strength. So what are you saying? You're saying a a mighty, mighty man? Yeah, that's basically what you're saying. You're saying a mighty man of valor is what you're describing. A giver, Chayil, is a mighty man of valor. Let's take a look at this in the scriptures when it says a mighty man of valor. You can go to the next slide. This giver, Chayil, here are the first seven times that it's used in the scripture. We're going to go over these quickly together. We just read Joshua 1.14. It's talking about the Transjordan tribes. Give me your mighty men of valor to come with us, fully armed. Turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. Let's look at verse 1. It says, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. (laughs) I love that. God was already laying siege to Jericho before they got there. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its giver, Chayil. Along with all of their fighting men, along with their best men of valor that they can muster, the Lord is saying, I'm going to deliver them into your hands. Let's take a look at Joshua chapter 8, verse 3. Are you all with me? Okay, stay with me. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best Gibber Chayils. 30,000 of his best fighting men, the best men of valor that he had. Let's turn to Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10 and verse 7. We're going to get to this in, in after Pastor Eric and the team gets back from Turkey. We've got Joshua 9 and then Joshua 10. This is an incredible chapter. You can, you can get a sneak peek and you can read it ahead of time. And you're still going to be blown away when we get to it and study it together. Verse, chapter 10, verse 7. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, <laughs> including all the best fighting men. It seems like if you would say the entire army, it would include... Yes, it would include the special forces guys as well. But they wanted to make sure the word of God says, hey, these guys are about to go battle all the kingdoms of the world. And we want to make sure that you understood that he took all, not only the whole army, but he took the best. He took the Gibber Chayil, all of that special forces troop. He took them with him too. Turn to Judges chapter 6. These are the first seven times that they're used. Judges chapter 6. Let's look at verse 11. Story of Gideon. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at Ophrah. They belong, that belonged to Joash the Abezerite. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press. What do you do in a, what do you do in a wine press? Apparently if you're Gideon, you thresh wheat. Keep, to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, 
the angel said, The Lord is with you, Gibber Hayil. He's hiding. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. He's trying to keep things from the enemy. He's afraid. And the angel of the Lord addresses him and says, You're a Gibber Hayil. Turn to Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter 11. Look at verse 1. Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a Gibber Hail. His father was Gilead. His mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. Let's do one more. In Ruth, Joshua judges Ruth, the next book. Let's look at chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2 says this, verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a Gibber Hail, whose name was Boaz. First seven occurrences. Most of these, especially to a church like ours, if you could put that slide back up, the one that we were just on. The Gibber Hail, it, it walks through these things, and these are all fairly familiar stories to us, right? The Transjordan tribes, we've just been studying this. The Battle of Jericho that God was going to deliver those Gibber Hayils into the hands of God's people. <laughs> Up at I, version 2.0. This was the successful trip. The kingdoms of the world in Joshua 10, Gideon, Jephthah, and Boaz. You know what I, I figured that I would look? Is we've been learning that even uh, this, the Lord loves us enough that not only is there a plain meaning that you can see, but when you start digging and start putting things together in the order that God allows them to occur in the Bible... Haven't we been learning that they tell a story? Yeah. Pastor Eric did that with the Yare and the Kathoth, the fear and discouragement. And you realize that it was 17 statements in 36, occurred 36 times in 17 verses. 17 statements that give us a story about what we're supposed to do. I try to do this with Gibber Hayil. Let's take a look at what this is. To be a Gibber Hayil here today, men. For you to be able to do this, not just talk about it, not want to be it, but to actually be this mighty man of valor that God wants you to be, you must help your brothers. Because God will deliver the enemy to you. We can overcome failure. We can defeat the kingdoms of this world. Because God will help us to shed our self-sufficiency. He will rid us of the shame of our past. And he can cause us to become men of standing and be part of the royal bloodline. That's in order. I, I'm amazed at what God does for us. You can read each of those stories and be incredibly blessed. You can think about what it's like to be a man of valor and, and, and be challenged in your soul. You can think about Gibber, Hail, and want to go after it. And you can also see, as you start piecing them together, what it teaches us about his word, about how to accomplish this. I love the fact that it starts off with, I need my brothers and my brothers need me. Amen. Guys, the things that God has imparted to us as a church, they're for real. They're from the heavens. They're not just things that we've thrown together because we like the way they sounded. These are nuggets. These are gold. These are precious treasures that the Lord has given us as a church to say, men, you've got to be a man of valor. There's nothing less on this Father's Day that we can encourage you to be than an actual man of valor. Amen. Not one that backs down, that one that is, there is no cowardice anywhere in us. Yes. And when you find it, you root it out and you destroy it in your life every single time. Yes. You need your brothers because God will deliver the enemy to you. You can overcome any amount of failure. We will defeat the kingdoms of this world. It is our place to put our boot on the neck of the enemy. Under our feet, that God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. I think it's exactly referencing back to Joshua 10, by the way. God will help us to shed our self-sufficiency. Men, anybody in this, in this room need to, need to shed some self-sufficiency? Right? By the way, when I'm looking up videos, I'm trying to think about doing something kind of fun and lighthearted, yeah, they were all silliness. Like men who won't stop and ask for directions. Nobody in here does that. 
None of the men in here are self-sufficient. Yeah, actually we are. But we're also going to be men of valor. And we're going to learn to shed our self-sufficiency. That's what God did in Gideon's life. He took away the 32,000 and whittled it down to 300. Why? Because Gideon was too self-sufficient. Lest the people think that they did something great instead of God. He will rid us of the shame of our past so that we can become a man of standing and be a part of the royal bloodline. We're going to dig a little bit deeper. We're going to dig a little bit deeper. We're going to go on to the next slide. I want to show you the paleo. So we're looking at the actual plain text of those seven times of Giver Ha'il and in Deuteronomy where we know that the Lord is mighty. And then we piece all the stories together and we get another story that reminds us and gives us a pathway to walk on. When you start looking at the paleo, here's what you get. And by the way, uh, I don't have the main podium over here. This, these slides, you can't see them maybe from where you're sitting, but this is our paleo chart that we have. Men, if you need a new one of those, if you don't have one of those in your Bible, I encourage every man and every woman in this place to have one of our paleo charts. We have some in the podium that I can get you after. It's a gimel. It's supposed to be a foot. It's going to walk. It's going to help us know how to walk or to gather. It's a bet. We've already talked about this. The actual paleo sign here, I'll do them bigger on the board just to help us out. So we have a gimel, looks like a check mark. It's supposed to be a foot. We have a bet. This is supposed to be the idea of a tent floor plan, if you're looking at it from above. Little door for the tent, right? A vav. It's a tent peg. Or a resh. Uh, however that looks like. The resh. Yeah, that's, that's terrible. I'm sorry. I thought I could do it while I was talking. Apparently, I can't. Uh, okay, there you go. Looks like a puppet, but just, I'm, going, I'm going for a rest here. What we have is, when you have the gimel, you have, you're going to gather. What is it like to be a, a gibor kind of man, a mighty man? Look at the words that we choose from the main words that you can get. If you're going to be a gibor kind of man... You're going to be a man who gathers your family and attaches them to a priority. You can look at this. This is straight from our chart. This is not me trying to manipulate anything. If you're going to be a mighty man, you know what you need to do? You need to gather your family. You need to have your family around you. You need to pull them close and say, hey guys, this is the priority in our lives. This is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. You know why? Because I'm the father and I'm going to be a giver kind of man. I'm going to show you the direction. I'm going to pull you close because this is what I was called to do. Therefore, it's what you're called to do. We can have purpose in our life. We can go forward. That sounds like a mighty man to me. If you stay where you have been, if you stay lamenting the fact that, oh, well, I'm not a giver kind of man. I, I don't do this. Um, how, can I, how can I say this? Uh, stop your whining. Grow up. Be an actual man. If you haven't been, then it's the dumbest thing in the world to continue in that way. Well, I haven't been very gibber in my life. Well, then shut up and start being a giver. You're nev you'll never get there if you never start on the path. Well, I'm just not very aggressive. I don't care what your personality is. How about you learn what the Bible says and be a giver kind of man? Amen. This is the standard. We come up to the standard. We don't lament that the standard is too high. We don't say it's too far for us to get to. We start going toward the standard immediately. Can you go to the next slide? I, I put it a different way on this slide. Everything else is the same except for the last part of the definition. The paleo for Gibber is to gather your family and attach them to your mezuzah. This is exactly what we've been working on. This is exactly what some of you are working on and developing, to having a clear picture of what you're called to do. 
Wade Sutherland and the Sutherland family is called to equip and empower God's people for their works of service. That's what we're supposed to do. That's the only reason we've put on the, been put on the planet. Anything else is, as we say in Louisiana, it's lanyard. If I don't accomplish that, and if I don't lead my family to do that, then I am nowhere close to being gibber. I can talk about it, I can use the phrase, but I am not because I would not have gathered my family under my instruction and led them to this position. To gather your family. <clears throat> Guys, I was praying about Father's Day. I was praying about this for a while. And on Wednesday night, I, I, heard, I heard the phrase, you've got to circle up the families. The families need to circle up so that they can go towards it. And I was like, Lord, I'm sure there's some Hebrew word that does this. <laughs> Seriously, I was like, I don't know what it is. Like, how do I go backwards from, do I look at, you know, circle and time? I'm like, how do I know what word to go with, Lord? I don't, I don't know. But yes, I hear you saying we should circle up. And I knew we were doing a parenting class, so I was like, maybe I'm stuck on that. And then last night, I'm praying like, Lord, I want you to show me what to do. And clear as day, he just said, Gibber Hail. And I went, well, that's fun. It's a manly kind of thing to do on Father's Day. Great. It wasn't until this morning we started studying and we did this, and I went, <laughs> this is gathering the family. It's almost like God is trying to tell us something. <laughs> Man, look at me. If you're married in this place, your family is you and your wife, by the way. You don't have to wait to get kids before you start your family. You've already started your family if you're married. You pull them close. Look, if you're a wife in here, does this bless you the thought of gathering your family close and going in the right direction, going in a singular direction where you know where you're going? This is incredible. Let's look at the next word, hayil. It's a het. It's a yod, and it's a lamed. It's a het, which is supposed to be like a tent wall. <laughs> it's a yod, which is supposed to be like a hand. And it's a lamed, which is a shepherd's staff. Okay? So we see that the het, this one always gets kind of confusing, truthfully, when I'm doing it in, in the paleo. I'm like, I'm not always quite sure how to do outside divide, the other word is half. We'll get to that in a second. This is our work or our worship. And this is a yoke or teaching. Okay? If you're going to be a gibber kind of man, you gather your family and attach them to your mezuzah statement. That filter, that's what the filter on everything is. If you're going to be high yield and add this, what you have to do is you have to divide your work and your worship and the teaching of the Lord from everything else. Let me, let me show you this real quick. Do you all remember what this letter was? Bet. It's a bet, right? It's supposed to be a tent. If I'm supposed to divide, this is supposed to be a tent wall. That's what the picture is, is of. So if I'm a gibber, I'm going to gather my family and attach them firmly to the direction. But what does this do? If this is the tent wall, I've got to keep every outside force away from getting in and bothering my family and damaging the goal, damaging our work, our worship, and the very teaching from heaven. I've got to stop this because I've got to set up the tent wall and say, no, it's dividing. You can't come in here. You can't do this. These influences will not be a part of my home. I have to do whatever it takes, but I'm going to stop all of these things. I'm keeping them all outside. I'm keeping them all divided from us, and that is my job because I'm a giver, Chayil. That's what I do. That's my job in this thing. It's to gather my family, you know what, and I'm going to put them inside here. When I was a school teacher, I was a band director, and we'd go on trips. We'd go on band trips. And I'd bring 60, 70 kids across the country, sometimes flying, sometimes riding on buses. And here was my spiel. We would get to the hotel, and I would gather all my little chickadees around me. High school-age kids from 
14 to 18. I'm in charge of 70 of them in a hotel, in a foreign city. Well, not foreign. <laughs> Orlando, you know, whatever. But and I was like, and this, this was my spiel. I'm, I'm a 23-year-old band director taking kids on a trip. Stupid. Like, <laughs> what was I thinking? I cannot control everyone in this hotel. I cannot control every bad thing that, will, that could possibly happen to you. But what I can do is your leader is I can control you and keep you safe. I didn't know it at the time, but the Lord was helping me to understand these principles. If I gather them and keep them close, then I can protect them. What happens if they go off and they do something they're out past curfew? I, I was merciless. I was like, I will, on the first infraction, if I think that you've done something inappropriate to get outside of where I want you, I will send you home and I, I will fly you home and I will charge it to your parents. There is no warning. Me talking to you now is the warning. Right? Why? I can't fix the whole world. I, I, can't, I can't possibly give them every uh, example of what bad thing could happen. So I just said, you do what's right, and this will be the best trip of your life. So fathers, husbands, men in the room... You can't necessarily fight the force on every front, can you? You're just one person. I, I can't necessarily defend every opening in, in, a, in a mall situation, me by myself. I've got too much to cover. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get you where I can know exactly where you are, and then I can defend you with my life. Amen. Then I can take my stand. I can't, I can't take a stand. Uh, parents, are you like this? When my kids, we were at the men's retreat, and Gabe was having an incredible time, and I said, Gabe, I need you to come in. Why? Because I just want to go to bed. He was, he was with brothers. He was with godly people doing godly things. And I went, I need to be able to rest. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Come lay down. Your day is done, so my day can be done. <laughs> Anybody else ever done that as a parent? Yeah, I'm not even saying you're doing something bad. I'm just tired. You go to bed. That doesn't make any sense to a kid because you're like, yeah, but I wasn't. No, no, no. I fully grant you nothing bad was going on. Just go to bed. Because I need to have you in a place where I can put the tent wall up. I can divide the outside world and I can keep our work and our worship and our yoke going the right direction. Come on now. <clears throat> Gibber Hail. Gibber, to pull your family close, to gather them, to get them attached to your mezuzah. Hail. I hope this picture means something to you. It meant something to me this morning. Hail. We're going to divide everything else. You know what? We need to have a little bit more of old school in us. Everybody say old school. And really what we're saying is this kind of old school. <laughs> like all the way back to ancient Hebrew. Yeah. My family's just not going to do certain things. I love you guys. The Sutherlands, we're just not going to do certain things. You know why? Because this is my, this is my tent to defend. Amen. This is my place. And I'm not even saying you're doing it wrong. I'm just saying for us, I'm not comfortable unless I can have my little people in my little space that we can work and worship and learn the teachings from the Lord and go forward on our mezuzah statement. I'm, I just not am right until they're all gathered together. Because they're under my covering. If you're going to be a gibber high yield, that's exactly the way you need to respond. Let's turn and read a few scriptures together. Uh, actually, let's do this. I actually want you to see a video. But before we do that, let's turn to one scripture. <laughs> Teaser. Isaiah 49. You could, just, you could just leave the video ready. Isaiah 49. If you've been around at all, <laughs> if you've heard our pastor speak at all, since October, you know about Isaiah 49. I want you to see something. In Isaiah 49, let's do chapter, uh, verse 24. Verse 24 says this, Can plunder be taken from gibbers? Can plunder be taken from warriors? Or captives rescued from the fierce? But this is what the Lord says. Yes. Everybody say yes. Yes. Captives will be taken 
from the gibbers, from the gibber high heels that are in this world, our captives, we're going to take it from them. And plunder retrieved from the fierce. I will contend with those who contend with you, and your children I will save. It's almost like there's a link between being a gibber high heel and our kids. It's almost like there's a link between being a gibber high heel and accomplishing God's work to bring back the lost, to steal plunder from the warriors. Listen to this from uh, this morning. Hello, LCM. We are standing outside of Bergama. This is biblical Pergamum. It's one of those cities that has a unique history. The Bible says that this is Satan's throne. More than that, a faithful witness named Antipas, you might say an original DCD, was here a long time ago. His name means that he stood against everything. That's because this was the religious center of the Roman Empire before Rome was. We wanted to send you a quick note. We understand that you're studying this morning, Gibber Hail. Well, mighty men of valor have been entering into the enemy's territory and rescuing goats from the savages of hell for a long time and turning them into sheep. Thank you for sending us here. We fully intend to go stand on the spot they say Zeus was born. See, our God was not born. He's not a created thing. He did indwell the man Jesus Christ and that spirit now indwells us. We pray that you have a spirit-filled service here today and we want you to know that we fully intend to see souls saved in this Muslim heartland. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you. Perform out there what you've practiced in the service today. Amen. Love you guys. Technology is such a fun thing. You can be texting with our brother on the other side of the world, praying with him, having them share that with us. They sent that to us a little bit after 10 o'clock this morning. Knowing and sharing, we're sharing back and forth with each other. Guys, we're a one body. We're a body that's made up of giver high heels. Let's turn just a few scriptures and then we'll close. Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 2. And let's look at verse 12. This is actually where our brothers are at the moment. What you saw there on a roadside by a roadside sign is what we're about to read about. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. Are you there? Yes. To the angel of the church at Pergamum, write, which is now Bergama. These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name, you did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Folks, I, I'm not sure of any other place in the Bible that says this is where Satan lives. This is where his throne is established. When I'm saying that I want us to lead our families, when I'm saying that I want us to pray for a pastor and the team, I'm saying that we've got to pray and we've got to lead our families like a group of gibber high heels. By the way, there is there's a word that there are words that mean a very close thing for this for our ladies. And it's actually the introduction for Proverbs 31. But this is not Mother's Day. So I'll let you trace that out. We're going to stay on the men today. But men, fathers, women, children, young people, we are all called to be this. This is the spirit that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have this gibber, hyel kind of spirit about us. While we're in Revelation, turn to Revelation chapter 7. I'm so thankful for Cassidy earlier. Revelation chapter 7 is where she read from, under the inspiration of the Lord. Verse 9, Revelation 7, 9, says this, After this I looked, and there before me were, was a great multitude that no one could count. <laughs> I love the Bible. No one can count it. From every nation from every tribe, from every people and every language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. 
These people understood what it was like to be giver chayus, to stand strong in the face of adversity, to have deeds of righteousness that allowed them to be clothed in white. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen! Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and gibor be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is the men that we stand with. And in closing, let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. My friends, the strength of today... I hope you're blessed as a husband. I hope you're blessed as a father. I hope this is the best Father's Day that you've ever had. If you don't yet have kids, we're going to pray for you that God will give you that blessing. If you don't yet have a spouse, we will pray for that, and God can bless you. And what we all do is in the meantime, until we're waiting, until we see, we act as a giver ha'il. We gather whatever family we have around us, and we go towards God's purposes. We defend it from the outside forces, even if it costs us our life. That is what we do. And this is how we do it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. I'm sorry, verse 28. It says, We proclaim Him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone. perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all of His might, with all of His energy, which so powerfully works within us. We've got to have the attitude of a giver, Hayu, and we've got to rest on his strength that it so powerfully works in us. <laughs> I want to be emptied of my self sufficiency, and I want to have a spirit that says, I'd rather die than let my family get hurt around me. I would rather die than not accomplish God's will. I would rather absolutely die than to not be a giver, Hayu. Would you guys stand today with us?